Good afternoon or good morning, perhaps good evening, wherever you are. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the editor and VP of Streaming Media and the conference chair for all of our streaming media events, both in person and online. We hope to soon be having another in-person event in Boston, May 24th and 25th. Mark your calendars. That's 2022, of course, for Streaming Media East. We'll also be having another virtual Streaming Media, a Streaming Media Connect in February, cleverly called Streaming Media Connect February in February. Did I say February? I think I said February. It's been a long week, folks, but we're still having fun. You can look for information on both of those events very soon. Before we jump into our discussion today, which is about the future of ad tech, uh, a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions for any of our panelists, please put them in the Q&A in your Zoom window. It's right at the bottom of your, uh, your Zoom window. Press Q&A and enter your questions there. The chat is open, but if you put your questions in the chat, I can't guarantee that our moderator will see them. So please put them in the Q&A. Also, live transcripts or subtitles are enabled. If, you, if you're seeing them run across the bottom of your screen and you wish to turn them off, go down to live transcript and select hide subtitles and they'll go away. Finally, just for being here, you're entered into a drawing to win a $50 Amazon gift card, but here's the catch, you must be present to win. So stick around until the end to find out who won the Amazon gift card. I'd also like to thank our diamond sponsors for Streaming Media West, Conviva, Limelight Network, Signiant, and Video Guys. And I'll pass things over to our producer, Mike, to roll a video message from each of them right now. Videoguys.com is your source for PTZ cameras with the productions of all sizes. Add multiple camera angles to your production without adding operator. Perfect for houses of worship, corporate AV, education, and more. Video Guys offers cameras from PTZ Optics, Bird Dog, Panasonic, and New Tech. Control these cameras using an IR remote, control app, or hardware controller with serial or network connection. Go to Videoguys.com or call us at 800-323-2325 for help finding the camera that's right for you in this era of streaming video we are pioneers helping make your stories more vibrant conviva lives in billions of apps on devices all over the world measuring trillions of data points each day to provide real-time insights for your content ads and social conviva every stream every screen every second Conviva is also sponsoring this panel. So thanks to them for that. And with that, I'd like to ask, well, Nadine, you're here. I did. I popped in early. Awesome. I'm Let's very excited. Everyone else pop in as well. Okay. And I will pass it on over to you so we can get things started. Excellent. All right. Thanks. Perfect. Well, uh, I am very happy to be here with our panel on the future of ad tech. And I have a lot of people, but we're going to let them introduce themselves and also tell you exactly where in the ad tech workflow they are, because kind of like the stock market, there's the buying, the selling, the running of the technology, the measurement, there's all sorts of things. Anyway, I will go over to Todd first. Todd, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Todd Overstreet from Discovery, I'm based out of Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, so I'm on the publisher side of the house, responsible for the uh, digital ad sales systems and tech and operations teams. Okay, cool. Steve, how about you? Steve Maher, I'm with SyncBack. Um, 
we provide uh, business to business services, you know, streaming services for several hundred television stations across the U.S., as well as a uh, direct to consumer uh, product which aggregates several hundred TV stations' local content. So we do uh, remonetization in all of those uh, scenarios. Okay, very cool. Adam, you're a little different. Thanks, Nadine. Um, my name is Adam Markey. I run the product team uh, at Roku for um, OneView, which is our demand side platform focused on TV streaming. Okay. Demand side means you do what? That means we help buyers, um, those who are purchasing media, connect to uh, a lot of the publishers um, and uh, plan, measure, and optimize their campaigns in a single self service interface. Okay. So you're helping someone like Todd in that sense. Joe, what part of the ad tech workflow do you cover? Um, I typically oversee all facets of the ad stack for media and entertainment companies. Uh, I came through the Philadelphia Inquirer, then to Discovery Networks, then to Fox Networks Group, then to the Walt Disney Company, and now I'm consulting. Okay, and you make sure the ad tech stuff is running, right? Yeah, we make sure our inventory is appropriately segmented and saleable uh, out into the world at large. Okay, all right. Jared, how about you? You've been on my panels before, but introduce yourself. Uh, Jared Wolichinski, uh, Viacom CBS. Uh, I guess I, I'm in the seller seat of the house, you know, and oversee our business and, and ad operations. So ad tech relationships, workflows, uh, QoS, things of that nature. Okay, very cool. And Shao is our sponsor for today. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, thank you, they, yeah, I'm sure from Conviva. So for some of you from ad type background, you may not know Conviva. Uh, so Conviva actually has been around for 14 years now. So we are a leader in streaming analytics. For the last 14 years, we've been focusing on providing real-time analytics data, mainly for the quality of experience space. And this year we're expanding to advertising insights. So we are more on the measurement side, looking at the whole spectrum. Uh, so very glad to be on this panel and I look forward to the discussions. Cool. All right. Um, so I think we're going to start off now with when we did the planning session, I asked everyone what was the top thing that people were talking about. And the weird thing, or not so weird, is server-side ad insertion, old news, header bidding, header bidding, why? Okay, Todd, can you, you brought this up to start with. Why don't you explain what header bidding is in the quickest, easiest way you can do it. Uh, sure, so I'll, I'll explain it in the context of um, server-side ad insertion on a CTV platform. So it's actually not header bidding. Um, that's more of a leftover term from pure web-based stuff, but the concept is the same. Uh, the idea that we are requesting out to a bidding endpoint, um, looking to see if there is demand um, from a demand provider based on the device itself, um, tied back to the user, tied back to the geo, tied back to uh, any other data point that the demand source may have that we're requesting the bids from. And then receiving those bids back, if those are devices that the demand source finds interesting, and then uh, proxying them back into the ad request to be delivered on by the ad decisioning logic for whatever ad serving platform um, um, the, plat the platform's using to deliver the ads. Okay. That's the yeah. simplest version I can give you. Okay. Now, uh, Jared, <laughs> so what happens? Why is header bidding going to make you potentially more money than the previous way you got <laughs> inventory? Um, well, it's, it's a way to enhance competition. So okay. historically, header bidding was originally made up to combat uh, Google Ad X for the most part in a display world in that you wanted additional SSPs to compete on inventory and you know doing bidding outside of a single SSP was a, a way to kind of let CPM, let, let things compete a lot more and hopefully drive up CPMs. So okay. uh, you know the, that's the nature of it, you know, where, where it helps from an operation standpoint is, you know, typically in video prior to header bidding tactics, variable fill vast was widely used. Here's a vast tag. 
You call it, you hope you get an ad back. You don't know if you are, you don't know what you're going to get back. Header bidding is a way for that bid process to happen prior to ad selection. So if that bid happens to win in your ad selection, you know you have an ad, you know something about that ad, you might know the industry, you might actually know the brand, but it's it removes that, that variable nature of like, do I have something or not? It, re it really helps at least keep, keep the executional process a little, a little cleaner when you're trying to put together an episode. Okay. It, and, and in my simplified terms, you're going from kind of a waterfall to a group Correct. bid. Right. You've, okay. you've removed the waterfall more, okay. more or less from the like, more waterfall. Okay. Um, so we've got header bidding. We've, we've kind of explained what it is. Is everybody here who can, not all of you can, but is everybody here using it? You can shake your head or nod your head or say something. Yeah, we, we got that. I think okay. It's almost de facto in a way. Okay. All right. So it's de facto, but yet people have not brought it up in the past. I wonder why. Um, so with header bidding, it's it's a programmatic thing, is it? Joe? Um, yeah, sorry. It's a way to balance requests from multiple uh, demand providers into a single uh, request. Typically, you would go through the waterfall previously, at which point it would be incumbent upon your waterfall provider, you know, Google's free, free wheels of the world, um, to balance your bid in their ancillary markets. But they might have preference for their programmatic stack, at which point you could potentially be losing yield uh, because you're not putting a competitive bid out that could oftentimes compete with your direct sell stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't like it. So I'll introduce some controversy here. To me, it's an okay. inelegant solution <laughs> to the promise of an SSP. Okay, like an SSP why? Was supposed to, well, an SSP is supposed to bring the demand. They're supposed to have the demand that you need. Uh, okay. That's their offer. Uh, but they suffer from the same market conditions that premier publishers do, which is there's not all available marketers, available campaigns, available ad creative. So publishers had to resort to this solution in order to fill the holes uh, in, the, in the bid requests. Uh, but if you look at the bad side of it, on one side, you're right, it increases yield. But the bad side of it, um, it's another integration piece in your, your code base. Uh, so it's another point of failure, potentially, another thing that needs to be troubleshooted and triaged. Uh, and then secondarily, it has potential to increase uh, latency in an already fragmented market, uh, making, I don't know, it's just, to me, it's not, it's not quite there yet. It's one of those things that uh, evolved to fill uh, a very real need, but isn't the best solution. Okay. And the latency is from what? It's more hops in the ad stack. If you're soliciting multiple builds and it's not through your primary ad server, but through your quote unquote header to uh, Todd's point about it just being a, a legacy terminology, um, that just adds to your uh, uh, signal chain. Okay. And the implementation, it has to go into everything. So somebody has to write yeah. it. Okay. Yep. So that means development, that means quality assurance, that means every time you iterate on an app release or any one of your connected device partners uh, doesn't update, you have to go through a whole another round of stuff in order to make sure it all works. Kind of sounds like server side, not server side, sorry, client side ad insertion, but I'm going to go into something else about this in terms of, we talked previously about reach frequency and being able to understand what you're serving. So Jared mentioned that you might find out what industry you ha are, are receiving um, creative from, but what normally happens, um, people complain about reach and frequency. What does that mean? So I'm gonna go with Steve. Steve, can you kind of give us a little bit of background about what reach and frequency means to people? Well, I may not be the best person to ask this question, but, okay. you know, from our perspective, um, it all kind of boils down to the quality of the metadata that gets attached to the, you know, the, the ads that we get back. So, you know, that sort of is a guide that we use to determine how and when to show that particular ad. And if that, if the metadata isn't there with sufficient quality, then we don't really have an ability to make wise decisions about when and where to place that ad or, you know, the rate at which we should be showing it and so on. Okay. Yeah, may, maybe I can help with the, the why reach and frequency is important, at least from, from, the, buy, from the buy side. Um, 
you know, from, from the buy side, right, this really comes from traditional TV where, um, you know, where you have Nielsen measuring um, demographics of audiences based on a panel of users um, that are, you know, in the demo, right, where the, the demo is uh, male age 18 to 34 because, or, you know, so, some, some, slice, some slice of demographic like that because you know, they've been able to model a buyer, a, a marketer has been able to model that you know, those types of customers um, are the ones to reach to be able to buy their product. Um, the, the nice thing about the world of um, CTV is we can actually start to do things like control reach and frequency versus just kind of measure um, where it comes. But you know, as, as Steve said, it really, it, it's really important to have like a really solid foundation of of metadata or you know knowing exactly who your who your audience is um, to be able to control it um, and there's there's a lot of fragmentation of data across um, across the ecosystem which you know hasn't hasn't isn't really getting better um, with the way privacy regulations and, and device identifiers are going but from a buy side it's something we we focus on every day okay um, okay so I had two different directions I could take this in I'm going to go first to the CTV aspect, because that's what you brought up. Um, Shuel, what, where is your kind of part of this? When, when people are delivering on CTV, what is it that you are doing? Yeah, so I think both Steve and Adam, they mentioned, you know, the foundation is a clean metadata. So that's what we are really good at from, from Conviva side. So we have a SDK deployed very consistently across all the different platforms and regardless of what operating system. So we collect data in a very consistent way and we clean the data, normalize data for the publishers. So that's where we play and contribute to the industry. So I think speaking of CTV ecosystem, completely agree with everyone here, it's very fragmented. That's why it's making data collection a big challenge. So that's why we are, you know, expanding our product suite from purely, you know, the quality of experience side to advertising side. So in the future, hoping to help everyone here, help the industry provide cleaner data. Okay, now I'm, I, I think I first wanna to go to talking about kind of some of the technical challenges in CTV so people kind of understand what is going on here. Who's, who kind of wants to kick this off? <laughs> I, Todd does. <laughs> I can speak on that, Nadine. Sure. Uh, you just want me to give you uh, kind of yeah. Get, give us off. kind of a little bit of a background as to why CTV has technical issues for you. Um, oh, we lost your audio, even though it looks like you have audio. No. Okay. How about, are you cabled? Yes. Okay, you're back. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I think you have a short in your cable. Are you sure it's a CTV that has issues? I think any screen has issues. Okay. So unfortunately, Todd, I think your cable might have a short in the port or, okay, can I hear you now? Can you say something? How about now? Yeah. Okay. okay. Talk. All right, I'll keep going until okay. I crash out and Jared and Joe can step in if it gets ugly. Okay. Um, so I would tell you this. So if you go back to the um, web, right, we used to be able to run debug sessions, Charles sessions, any kind of listing device against web, mm -hmm. find out what was happening on the client device from the ad request to the ad payload to the beacons. And you really got the whole picture, right? The cookies that were being set. As you move into the CTV universe, you move into server side ad insertion you start to fragment that play. You've got the dynamics of the server side stitching, making the request to your ad serving platforms, the ad serving platforms responding in the server with the ad payload or manifest, and then the stitcher having to unwrap tags, go through there, stitch that in, unify, zip it up with the content, and shove it back down to the client along with beacon payloads. Those beacon payloads, we started out with server side with server side beaconing, um, but there's a whole host of issues that go along with that. So we've moved down to client side beaconing. So now you've kind of abstracted the idea of you've zipped up or stitched the content the ads together at the server, and now you're going to beacon down at the client's device. So you've created a separation of 
it's called church and state. So when you're monitoring that, or you're trying to debug, you can see on some platforms, not all CTV platforms, you can turn on debug mode, you can turn on um, kind of a sniffing, listening um, piece of it, depending on the platform, Roku, Fire TV, things like that. And you can start to see what's coming down in the stream, but that's just what's been sent back to the client, right? You can't see what's happening in the server. So then you have to go pull logs from either your ad server, depending on how often those logs are landing, it might be next day, it might be three hours from now, it might be whatever your log process time is, or you have to go back and pull from the stitcher. And again, they might have different landing times for their logs. And you start to look at what was the request? What were all the key values pairs that were in the request from the stitcher to the ad server? What was the payload that the ad server sent back along with all the beacons, all the third-party tags, any sort of vast three multi-response that might come back. How was all that unwrapped? Where did we reach out to Jared's point to the ether and got nothing from one of these tags and had to fall back and stitch in backup. So we preserve the monetization of the stream and then cross compare it with what you got off of the client in terms of beacons fired and or beacons that were recorded in your ad serving logs to make sure all of that is harmonized and unified. You used to be able to do that in about a 15 minute session. Now that takes me about a day to quantify those logs, stitch it all back together and deal with the processing time between the servers. That adds to the level of complexity by times 100 from what it used to be. Okay. All right. Well, that pretty much covered it. Anybody want to add a little bit more before I go on to the question yeah, that me, builds on that? Yeah, let me just uh, dovetail a little because Todd gave an excellent, excellent uh, a deep dive. But you know, the use cases across our organization you know, if you consider uh, an instance where we don't have signal in runtime, you know, look at a live linear event, something like the Super Bowl for us, you know, it's important for us to be able to monetize that audience because that audience disappears after the game's over. Uh, so if we're not able to, you know, if we experience an outage or a breakage on one of the many endpoints that it's playing out on, and we're not able to successfully, you know, troubleshoot and triage the issue, then we're introducing a lack of monetization and potentially audience drop off you know, uh, an instance of breakage for what it would be one of our tentpole events. Uh, secondarily, you know, if, you, uh, if you're a publisher and you distribute your content, you know, let's look at an instance where I'm in Los Angeles and Comcast is in Philadelphia. You know, I can't troubleshoot anything that's in, in market for Comcast. You know, I need somebody in that market to do that for me. And there's an expiration of time uh, before you're able to investigate and potentially resolve that issue. You know, in the digital world, we're used to, snapping our fingers and solving things uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, this introduces uh, some friction to that. Okay, but I get it. I, I'd also add that, uh, you know, I completely agree with what Todd and Joe said. Uh, one of the ways that we've historically tried to address that is by, by owning the whole technology stack. So, you know, our whole technology stacks developed in-house. So when it comes to log data, we have really fine-grained log data you know, that goes end to end in the system. And it's pretty easy for us to extract, you know, log trails of exactly what happened all the way through the system. The one thing that has thrown a wrench in that, uh, as others have pointed out, is uh, connected TVs, right? Because we don't typically, you know, that's one part of the technology stack that we don't directly own. Okay. And it's unfortunate because people seem to like viewing on connected TV. I'm going to jump a little bit. And I, this is Jared's favorite topic. And <laughs> do I even have to say anything, Jared, or do you want to just, you know, I'm start to, to... It's, it's something to do with like creative distribution and horrible ad experiences? Well, it more has to do with the kind of the ad ID thing. Oh, it's, yes. So, yeah, that's basically, yeah. Okay. Creative. So, he's a mind reader. He knows what I'm thinking. And he's going to tell you why there is a problem there, especially when it comes to reach and frequency. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And like, just to put that in perspective, it's, Reach and frequency, like you're watching something awesome on Paramount Plus, you're trying to uh, watch Picard. Uh, it's never gonna happen on P Plus because we don't allow it, but uh, um, you see the same ad break after break after break after break. You know, I think, you know, the, the supply chain and like how we all operate isn't a one way path to an advertiser. An advertiser can have a you know has multiple agencies so the same brand could have multiple direct ios inside of viacom cbs it could be coming in through roku one view 
via uh, a different agency in a different path. It can be an inventory share relationship. It can be a reseller. It could be a PMP. You name it, one brand can show up 50 different ways inside, uh, inside your ad server. So understanding you know, this ad, this brand, and being able to control that experience just for that one session on that one user is extremely difficult because there isn't a common set of scaled metadata uh, in use today to help with decision. Ad ID is absolutely a big step in that right direction because ad ID is a universal metadata element of advertising. You know, the agency, you know, the brand, you know, the length, you know, the actors, you know, the category. So that's, it's great to have if the buy side used it everywhere. It's still early days. There are other three letter big networks that are saying, if you want to run on me, you have to use it. Um, and I think it's gaining adoption. It's just, it's still not directly integrated into the brain of the ad server to, to use it. And then also in conjunction with that, the buy side doesn't actively use it. Sometimes they don't even know what it is. Uh, you know, again, this is a very linear heavy construct that is we're trying to put into digital. It's been part of ASS for years, still not taking off. So, you know, you know that, that I only need to see a bear wiping his butt once an episode, it's more like examples, is it's, it's hard to control that when that brand is coming through so many different channels and there isn't a common set of metadata and you know not every system talks to every system um it's it's a challenge and you know we're all consumers of streaming in one way or another and we all see it um and we all need to work together to improve it okay so i i mean why are there so many problems <laughs> You, well, we you took a display started. infrastructure and put it in a video infrastructure. Okay. All right. So that's where it started. Um, and well, there are could, the you know, occasional thing that works correctly, isn't there? Yes, of course. I mean, yeah. I mean, look, like these are, it's a, and, and, and like a lot of these things are possible to control to some extent. You can't, nothing in anything we ever do is 100.0. Viva can tell you about that. You're never perfect. You can get close. Um, in which case, you know, in order to do that, you need robust operations. You need data, you, you need massive data sets and, and turn those data sets into dashboards to react to these things and to control these things. You need like Conviva is a perfect, like we partner with Conviva. We have for, I want to say, I want I almost want to say 14 years, as far as long as I can remember. And we use those dashboards to, to monitor and look at certain elements. And you know, it's still very reactionary on what we're trying to do. Uh, and I think every year there's a new feature, there's a new thing in GAM or in Freewheel that helps us protect our protects our brands, our fans. I mean, we call them users, they're fans, they're in our apps for a reason to watch something they enjoy. You know, so I think those protections are getting more and more proactive, but it's still heavy reactive. Okay. Um, Shuao, since, you know, Jared mentioned, you know, how you're involved with them. Can you give us a little bit more light in terms of what specifically you're doing? Not exactly what you're doing, but just in general, what you're doing for somebody like Jared, not specifically Jared. Yeah, so... We are, so as, you know, Jared mentioned, so for Conviva, we are providing all these real-time data points to publishers, right? So we have our SDK deployed in the publishers' apps across all the platforms. Then we have the SDK running second by second. So we tell publisher, you know, is there any video quality issue? And, you know, is there any latency issue when you are loading the ad? So that's what we've been providing for the last 14 years. And with the new advertising insights, you know, we have these trillions of data we collect every day, right? So we can actually help publishers build 
a lot of features for advertising, like help publishers understand what is your reach, like deduplicated reach across these platforms. I know that's a big challenge mentioned by many people just now, right? There is no consistent data being passed through these, you know, uh, different CTV platform or CTV devices, but we have a single sensor deployed so we can help publishers understand what is the overall deduplicated reach across all your brands, across all your devices, platforms. And when we can then overlay a lot of measurement, like what is your audience, right? For each household, for each device, what kind of device is that? What kind of household is that? How many people are living in that household? What's their audience composition? What's their income? So these are very important information for publishers at sales team when they're trying to package their media plans and also important for buy side as well. So we are you know, there to facilitate better ad buying for the whole streaming industry. Okay, all right, I've got that. Now, we also, you know, I, I left CTV. Does anybody need to, to mention, since obviously CTV viewing has gone up quite a bit, Anybody else want to touch on that before we move on to the next topic? Um, just if we want to talk about the future here, and I would like to get back to what Jared said about the issue that he's having, which mm -hmm. is, you know, we're not able to fully identify what creative and we're potentially serving back-to-back -back creatives. Uh, we're causing ad fatigue and we're not introducing ad diversity. Um, I haven't seen anybody able to intercept and suppress the ad request at runtime in an instance that we're not able to identify the creative or have identified even the same creative. You know, and oftentimes, because the big problem is a lot of the marketplaces, it's often against their business model to even use the ad ID because their primary goal is to push volume. Mm -hmm. They don't really care that we're serving ads back to back. They just want to send volume our way so that we're able to say, so that they're then able to go to the rest of their customers and see how much volume throughput they have in their system. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's just an idea that would be out there, some way to do creative fingerprinting on the publisher side at runtime uh, okay. in order to suppress or divert advertising in that way. There's a, it's like, there are tools, depending on your ad server, your stitcher, that we, you know, and this all comes down to, you know, what do we say, maximizing revenue and uh, while maintaining a TV like user experience. So we, you know, we are proactive, at least in Viacom CBS, you know, across Pluto CBS, Viacom, the three-headed beast. Look, there's a bid, it has a high CPM. We throw it away because you know what? We just played that brand 10 minutes ago. And it's, you know, I, I think we, we try, it's, you know, there's always short-term and long-term views. You know, I think we always view a, a, a a great TV like user experience means the user is going to come back, watch more, and you know, and 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 balance that long term view versus that you know that single short term. Let's just keep banging out this thirty dollar bid, break after break after break because someone didn't put a frequency cap in the DSP and it's data targeted. So I want to go buy a Ferrari and I'm the you know that I'm not ID. We see it all the time, but they're, they're definitely how widely they're used, I think is probably more of the better way to describe it versus the capabilities. Um, so I, I do think they're there. I just don't think they're necessarily widely used, you know, you know, in that balance between revenue and experience. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, it, we've run into situations where, <clears throat> you know, back to back delivery of the same ad, even to two different viewers, had no metadata that would allow us to determine that it was really the same creative. And so we were even looking at resorting to just running a CRC across the creative so we could tell whether it was the same or different from a previous ad that we'd play, you know, we'd played. Because there there would almost appear to have been a, a conscious attempt to conceal the fact that the ad was the same. Okay. If if everyone provided, oh, I'm sorry. If everyone provided no, no. an ad ID, um, you know, from the from the publisher side, you know, you know, we're 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 a buy side platform. You know, we we have people logging in, loading creatives that may or may not have it. But if we provided the capability, and, and I look at when when a when a publisher has 
requirements like providing an ad ID or, or, or something there. We want to show the buyers that in the platform that they won't be able to buy that inventory if they don't meet some specification. Ad ID is one of them. Maybe like the, the video doesn't meet the, the, the spec for the bit rate um, is another thing that you know commonly comes up. But I'm wondering if we did provide a, an ad ID in every request, would it be possible um, for you to maintain either a good user experience or, or decide not to if it's a business reason to um, you know, kind of pump the volume? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. But that needs to be an agency mandate in order to say, uh, because it's brand protection. You know, We're trying to protect our audience on our side, but the agency really has to want to protect their brand uh, by not throwing away impressions or oversaturating in order to uh, maintain that experience. So we just need to come together a little. And I'll say this too, Adam and Jared mentioned it. We'll push the ad serving platforms to build that functionality into the core logic, but we'll also create logic upstream from the ad server uh, at the Stitcher to do any kind of deduping that we possibly can around a domain across uh, audio scraping of the. You know, I've seen I've seen some folks out there do audio scraping and get ads in their transcode trying to do the dedupes themselves. Mm -hmm. We'll deploy any and or all of those to make it a better solution because it means that most to us. Okay. I, I don't think there's ever going to be one single bullet that solves this, but I think Adam, to your point, encouraging ad ID is, is regardless of the spec or not, if an agency or advertiser has registered with ad ID, because you got to register, you know, you got to, there's still a process on that side. You know, SAG rights, I think, require ad ID usage. So for national ads, it's got pretty good coverage. Just no one puts it in. So encouraging it uh, is absolutely step one, but it is multi, it's a multi-pronged uh, solution to really get to the bottom. Okay. I'm going to move on to another topic. And, and, and I actually wonder whether this is even somewhat related, but when people talk about contextual is there, you know, meeting basically um, the content without having a lot of privacy information? So, is it possible to incorporate some of the technology that's used for identifying the contextual information to use it with the ads? Am I making this up? No, one hundred percent. It can be done. It can be done at the video object level. It can be done at the SRT closed caption file level. There are a lot of ways it can be done and then aggregated up into groups of assets that make sense from an inventory and um, sellable package perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously routing that back in from an inventory and yield management perspective, but it absolutely can be done. Okay. Uh, what about privacy? We started talking about this a little while ago, uh, maybe a year ago or so. Um, who wants to kind of kick off what some of the issues are with privacy targeting? Joe. Yeah, I can just, I can kick off the issue at large. It's okay. you know, signal loss. It's for companies who need these signals. And I hear I'm not talking about signal acquisition. I'm just talking about the customer endpoint signals that we get, uh, uh, the, the, the beacons, the metrics, the pips. You know, if companies lose that signal, then we lose uh, a few things. Uh, we lose the ability to resolve our audience. You know, if you're a Facebook, you, you, you lose that ability to do the personalization that they require in order to make their audience so valuable. And that leaves them struggling. You know, how do you balance personalization and privacy? Uh, we have uh, both international and national standards in the GDPR and CCPA that require that we do certain things for certain audiences. Um, so all of this you know, comes out to yet another fragmented ecosystem where we have certain signals for certain things on certain platforms, you know, rich signal from Android, reduced signal from Apple iOS and stuff like that, um, and potentially different rules to follow depending on the geolocation of where we're targeting. Uh, so to me, that's the big issue, but there's also technologies that are becoming uh, uh, more common you know, you have customer data platforms, which are becoming more interesting as a result. You know, customer data platforms are different from DMPs, a data management platform, and that a customer uh, uh, data platform can have long tail information. You know, lots of personal information that's been collected over time, user behavior, your registrant and self-selected information and stuff like that. And we're able to do interesting things with that, you know, given modern 
data coming, machine learning, and all that fun stuff, uh, you're able to get at a richer tranche of information from it. Uh, so the connections, in my estimation, that now need to happen is how do you connect the CDP meaningfully to your ADS, your ad decisioning system, to begin to play this out in real time appropriately uh, uh, and take it off everyone's mind. You know, you don't want the lawyers thinking about, well, what if you serve this ad and you're in violation of the GDPR? You know, you want a system in place that has a, a, a can do that for you and just take it off your plate. Okay. All right, shut up. You don't have to shut up. Uh, Jared, what about, you know, you have a lot of information, I would assume, because you've got registered viewers. But it, when you start thinking about being privacy compliant, is there anything that you had to do to change your technology? Um, not, not too much, because I mean, at the end of the day, the, the software we're using to power advertising, they're doing it kind of on our behalf. So, mm -hmm. you know, we know, you know, if someone opts out, you know, from, you know, from, from advertising or at least their, their device ID, you know, we know how that, the, you know, we, we know that zeros it out on certain devices or it puts into a static uh, IFA value on others. Um, you know, you got to just make sure you're putting in the flag correctly into your ad request, whether you're Google, free will, whatever it is, everyone has an uh, Islat uh, flag in it, in which case it triggers all of those, like shut this off, shut this off, don't collect, don't collect, you know, kind of those things all trickle down. You know, I think where things get interesting, or at least with, with the product that is, you know, all registration based, you know, on P plus, um, you know, as we think of our relationships with DSPs and advertisers, you know, the, the clean room approach of, you know, we, we clearly have email address. We know, mm -hmm. we know a, a user and that might tie back to a household. How do we do matches safely? You know, we don't want to, you know, here's a, here's an email, here's an Excel file with millions and millions and millions of email addresses. Like that stuff can never happen. You know, there's, there's a lot of protections we put in place to protect ourselves. But you know, there's also technology out there to help facilitate trading safely on double, you know, to clean room double blind matches, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. Okay. Now, um, I think one of the things that I still come back to is, is, is contextual doing enough for you? Is that something that you can use to kind of counter the loss of some privacy details? Yeah. You know, one thing, one thing on the, on the Roku one view platform. So while we have, we have, um, about 56 million active accounts that um, have email addresses and, and were able to match into the universe in the last 30 days, which is um, you know, a, a tremendous asset. Um, we, we could think of you know, modern connected TV advertising as um, kind of becoming converged between like the digital world where I could measure every single impression and you know, I'm used to getting data on everything and being able to attribute it back. And um, uh, in, in the world of CTV, um, it looks like a hybrid of this old Nielsen panel world and this new kind of digital world where we have we have a panel, but actually the panel in some instances, like for us, it's it's, it's quite it's quite big. But um, to be able to kind of understand and let marketers, you know, really really um, really know what's happening everywhere, there are going to be some gaps in signal loss and. Um, we can use contextual in some ways to bridge and model into that world with the known universe of people that we have um, into the unknown universe using those signals like contextual. So it's really important for us as, a, as an ecosystem um, to have a great taxonomy of categories, contextual categories uh, that, we're, that we're trading on between publishers and, and advertisers. So we know if we're measuring this category on this app um, and, it, and, it, and it performs well, it's highly likely, even though we don't know who the person is, um, that it's going to perform in a very similar manner in this category on this app. Okay. Now, in, in fact, we didn't really explain how contextual works. Does, it, does one of you want to grab this and just give us a very short description? Or I, I can do it. <laughs> I mean, for contextual targeting, or at least as as programmers, I mean, we know exactly 
the exact episode you were watching, and then you understand, you know, all you are you watching news, you watching sports, you watching Survivor, you watching this, you watching that, you know, you know, I, I mean, all of that, and that's one of the the I, I bigger benefits of the programmer in the ecosystem because like you started this there's programmers there's devices there's distribution partners there's others there there's a lot of different ways selling can happen the programmer typically is the one who can sell you and guarantee you specific content okay resellers yeah, distributors it's more audience it's more aggregated you know so you know from that contextual standpoint the, the programmer is always going to have kind of the biggest advantage because we're the ones that are really allowed to, to sell deeply in certain ways and even be transparent in certain places that that you know we can tell you exactly what show you ran on if we have you know since we we more or less have the rights to it versus others can't be transparent or, or have to be semi-transparent you know things of that nature um so and you know what they always say content is king you know it's it's very important to marketers to know what they're still running on given right. that you know it, you know i don't think it's a problem in you know in, in this brady bunch box but you you're buying in the the interwebs somewhere else you're running on stuff you probably don't want your brand running on um mm -hmm. so that transparency is is, is, is uh, on content is very powerful from a selling stuff okay i also think let's look at how oh uh, sorry Todd. I was just going to add one point it, it, from a, a programmer publisher point of view, if you're distributing content out to endpoints that may be obfuscating that data based on their platform or walled garden, the, if you know the contextual relevance of that, it can help you offset the loss of that data signal back to exactly what Joe was saying. But it's a, it's a unique problem for folks that are distributing their content out that still have ad sales rights. Right. Yeah, and then okay. if you're the owner of that content, you know, contextualization has a great opportunity to grow up uh, because you can start to, you can comb through your content and start to pull out sentiment. You know, you can start to pull out brands from your content. You can start to pull out uh, if the scene is happy or sad, uh, and you can start to pull out if it's fall or winter or spring or summer. There's lots of different interesting things you can do if you fully contextualize your inventory. Uh, sorry, my cat's going to join the thing with us here uh, okay it's very warm where she sits um anyway again you know getting back to what leverage do we have to pull with regards to the stuff that we own um this is a whole new nascent field that's opening up and it's beginning to offer out additional opportunities with regard to the contextualization of inventory okay all right i'm going to jump to a question we've got here and we have someone who says um edge computing um does edge computing fit into the equation and where the edge would be located so um the overall gist of the question is is edge computing relevant in ad serving ad delivery and where is the edge who wants to grab that or i live in on it man I'm living on the edge. I know I'm living on the edge. I'm living on the edge because we're talking about ad tech and and uh, you you guys are are I, I've heard there are so many problems in ad tech. I almost want to go and you know slip my wrist. No, where's the edge? Okay, somebody needs to answer this. Um, uh, this this has got Todd all over. It, I'll, okay, I'll, Todd, I'll where's take the edge? Shot at it. Um, I think it changes based on the complexity of your stack, right? You could argue the ad server is living on the edge, but I could also argue the ad server is caching the results of everything that it thinks is active in market to deliver on. Um, you could argue if you're building tools upstream uh, from the ad server that there's some decisioning happening there before it ever gets to the ad server. There's header bidding components. There's other things that you might decorate the ad call based on what you know about the connection, what you know about the device and all those other things before you ever get there. So that's happening in that construct construct. Um, so I think it just depends on where you want to put the definition of edge, right? Um, if you want to push cash logic out to the edge to deliver ads based on what are active placements, great, that's edge. Um, but it gets a little squishy about how you really want to define it. Yeah, I think okay. I think the to us edge, you know, this mentions edge computing. So I want to just talk about 
you know, we look at the providers that we use in this space, you know, uh, uh, software as a service providers, but there's a lot of competition now where there's backend as a service and infrastructure as a service. You know, you have uh, Amazon Web Services that offers 200 plus, not products, but services out into the marketplace. You can get a, you can get a freezer truck to show up at your place to come get your data from Amazon if you want to, or you can relay off of one of their satellites. They have a lot of interesting products, but you know, if you consider their specifically named edge computing platforms, you can use these to do a lot of interesting things. Potentially you could undercut uh, uh, service providers that you already pay for. And that kind of makes the whole build versus buy equation a little simpler. You know, why build something when you know you have an entity out there that's going to maintain this discrete set of services that they offer in perpetuity and add to them and connect them in meaningful ways and make it easier for you to use. Um, so I think that's, to me, that's the edge. Where's the competition and what are they doing and how are people looking to enter this market space? Okay. So I'd, I'd, I'd look at it slightly differently. I mean, from my perspective, we're talking about, I mean, the traditional edge computing model is to push as much of the computation as close to the consumer of the service as you possibly can. And in the ad tech world, really the most important thing is data, is information. And you know the best decisions about ad technology are gonna be made by having the most data consolidated in a single location. So to some extent that hierarchy runs counter to the idea of pushing computation out to the edge. I agree with the services model. I mean, if you're doing transcoding or you're doing ad stitching or whatever, you know, that stuff can move to different levels in the hierarchy. But if you want the best ad decisioning and to, you know, to serve the best ad payload, that's a centralized problem, not an edge problem. Right, and to, and to really kind of, um, it, it would be really great to be able to compute a creative on the fly on the edge as close as close to the user as it is, but the reality of TV advertising is that, you know, we, we actually want to control the experience, right. give people a great, uh, a great experience, and that, that kind of means that you, you have less ability to really react on the edge as fast as possible to that. Um, and then when you layer in technologies like SSAI and stream stitching to, to make it a smooth uh, experience, it, it becomes actually pretty, pretty hard to do. Um, on the data collection side, that's where, you know, we use um, edge computing heavily where, you know, we have like sensors and um, pixels and tags and SDKs out there um, to be able to kind of collect data so that, you know, when, when you know, a client is sending us information, uh, it's as fast as it possibly can across the globe. And that's usually the best, the best way to use that for us from a buy side perspective. Okay. Anyone else before I switch on to another topic? And and then the next topic, of course, is advertising. Um, 15s or 30s or something else. What what's popular? What what do people like or what what do you like? Who's asking? I'm asking. <laughs> I mean, okay, do do the viewers have how a are we funded when we answer this question? <laughs> I think you know, like, like viewers, I I, I mean honestly will always perform perform. Uh, prefer zero uh you know okay. that's why a lot of us have if you don't want advertising we have a 999 product and you can pay for it to not get advertising you know right. i think in order to have all this great content you know advertising helps pay for that so i mean that trade-off's there i think is that a question of sixes 15s 30s 90s especially in long form like if hey, this is why youtube had a lot more success with sixes or bumpers as they call them it's a short form and you know at that point it's like it's bite-sized content you want to you know get into it quickly you're only watching you're watching a couple minutes you know we're all talking about 22 44 out you know two hour long movies you know that i don't know how much length is that notion i'd almost put it as just have more relevant advertising is is probably the the better answer to that question in that you know i'm a household with kids I want to see these kind of ads, not, you know, something that's not relevant to me. You know, let me see the minivan ad. I don't need to see the Corvette ad, even though I want one, but, you know, you know, I think, you know, I think that that is a lot more of a powerful story uh, compared to length of that. Right. And, and, and I think, you know, on top of, on top of what um, was, was just said there, I think where the 15s and 30s occur. So if, if, if I have five, you know, three 30s, 
in a you know a two minute video versus three thirties in a uh, you know a ten or fifteen minute video, I'm going to think a lot differently based on that. So you really have to pair the content with the creative type um, to not you know have have a terrible user experience. Okay, and obviously we want to not have a terrible user experience. Optimize the revenue. Make sure the technology works. Have the way to measure it. Am I missing anything? No. Okay. In a privacy right, compliant just, way, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and and be privacy compliant. Uh, okay. We're and almost automate the operational workflows as much as possible. And automate the operational workflows as much as possible. And uh, professionally develop your staff and make sure that everybody's happy and uh, okay. is able to safely collaborate in a uh, non toxic environment. Okay. I'm I'm well, on I I mean, if this were easy, right, we wouldn't have to employ a lot of highly paid people to do it. We'd all be out of a job. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So my previous superhero power used to be that I was SSAI girl. So am I changing now? Am I like Ms. Ms. Header girl? Or am I, you know, where are we helping you in, in the world of ad tech? Who has the idea for the next superhero? Put it that way. I like You're the edge. Smiling. You like the edge? Yeah, I think okay. Eric had it right. The edge. The edge. Okay. So we'll just be like a, just, just, it's like people with one name, the edge. Yeah. And sorry, uh, no, Cynthia, I, like the, I had a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Cynthia had a question about where our contact information is. It's in the chat. You can click through all our LinkedIn exactly. so you need to. Um, and, and obviously, if there's something that you have a question about and don't find on our site right now, feel free to get in touch with Eric or myself and we will get you a question, get your question answered. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap this up by saying um, we've covered a lot of stuff. We, um, I, I think in the planning session, you guys mentioned that technology isn't the bottleneck, but it sounds like there's still some technology bottleneck and there's a lot of I guess, functional bottlenecks. Um, in the future, when we plan this next session, who else should we have come on that's gonna help you solve these problems? The ad agencies, who else? I think it'd make for a lot more of an, not an animated conversation, but I think that it's a tale of two cities. You know, you have buyer point of view and you have the seller point of view. I mean, Todd and I were on a call yesterday uh, and it's, you know, they have their priorities and, you know, it totally makes sense. And, you know, you know, the other side has our priorities and they don't always see eye to eye, especially when you talk about ad tech right. and how stuff works. They're focused on 30 seconds. You know, we're focused on two hours, you know, and there's an absolute disconnect on that. Um, and so, you know, it's, you know, I don't want to say panels or, or conversations are a lot more interesting and fun when people don't agree. I like to echo that. I think it's good to have both buy side and sell side. So for us sitting more in the middle as an independent measurement, we do see sometimes there are different priorities, different mm -hmm. sometimes objectives from the publishers and advertisers. Okay. I think we can do that. I think that we like to have these panels with all of you to talk about the technology challenges because people like to hear about what you're doing. Um, so, but since you've many of you have brought up these things over and over again, I think we'll listen to you. And um, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, is there anything else you'd like to wrap up with before Eric cuts us off and goes to the next panel? I, you, guys have, you all have been wonderful. And um, again, I know that ad tech can be a challenging thing. And I'm very happy you guys took the time to sit here and explain what you're doing. Um, thank you so much, Eric. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of our panelists. Thanks again to all of our sponsors, Conviva, Signiant, Limelight Networks, and Video Guys. The winner of the Amazon gift card for this panel is Gwendolyn Urban. And so Gwendolyn, keep your eye out on your email. Uh, the email will go out next week. Join us again in 30 minutes for our next panel about optimizing your live streaming workflow. Thanks, folks. All right.
Videoguys.com is your source for PTZ cameras that fit productions of all sizes. Add multiple camera angles to your production without adding operators. Perfect for houses of worship, corporate AV, education, and more. Video Guys offers cameras from PTZ Optics, Bird Dog, Panasonic, and NewTek. Control these cameras using an IR remote, control app, or hardware controller with serial or network connection. Go to videoguys.com or call us at 800-323-2325 for help finding the camera that's right for you. In this era of streaming video, we are pioneers, helping make your stories more vibrant. Conviva lives in billions of apps on devices all over the world, measuring trillions of data points each day to provide real-time insights for your content, ads, and social. Conviva. Every stream, every screen, every second.